Penny Brown, welcome to this week's edition of MFB News. I hope you're really well um, and had a good couple of weeks. I wasn't here last week. Um, I had a week off for half term in the rain and as you can see behind me, the sun is blazing through the window. Also, I just want to apologise. I've just realised how filthy my windows are, which is slightly embarrassing. Um, we are going to be getting them cleaned very soon, I can assure you. Um, but yeah, so um, I've had a, a one week off work. It was four actual days because of the bank holiday. And um, it all kicked off, didn't it? There was an election announced and this has gone on to have a knock on impact on the capital markets, which meant that the um, swap rates have moved and this is now filtering through to mortgage pricing. So we'll come on to that in a moment. Um, it would be remiss of me to not touch on the upcoming election, what a change in government might mean in terms of impacts on landlords. We're just going to go through what we know so far about each party's position in terms of impact, particularly on the renters reform bill. This is the one that I think is kind of the one we can talk about with some element of certainty at the moment. Um, and then we're gonna talk about what's been going on with house prices and finally wrapping up with kind of general landlord sentiment, landlord behavior by region in the UK. So you can see what your peers are up to. Okay, so interest rates first and foremost. And when we last spoke two weeks ago, um, swap rates were starting to ease down, then were starting to bring their pricing off the boil very, very slightly. And I ended the video saying, I'll catch you in two weeks with some new lower rates. Then the election got announced. And unfortunately, the capital markets have um, responded to that in a negative way or an adverse way for you guys. And their, the swap rates increased again now. Um, why is that? I think really um, at the moment, what the election does is bring in a whole bunch of uncertainty. And because neither party um, has currently published their full manifesto, no one really knows what it's going to contain. So for all we know, one of the parties could come out and make announcements about um, how they're going to, for example, slash taxes um, and do loads of kind of things which could be very inflationary in the style of Liz Truss and, Truss and Quasi Quarting. Um, now, I think that's very unlikely, but the point is that we don't know at the moment. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. So in terms of how this is shaken out, um, two-year swap rates currently at 4.612. Now, that is compared to one month ago where they were 4.487, so kind of 1.5% higher month on month. Five-year fixed rates, very similar story, um, currently 4.053. One month ago, these were 3.948. And actually, by the, you know, if we come more recently to that, they'd come down even further. So it's really frustrating, actually, because everybody... Um, is waiting for rates to come down. You know, we've seen so many people and they're just like, I'm just gonna hang on a bit longer and you know, wait for the rates to ease off because that's what we've been told is gonna happen. And then some other kind of grenade gets launched into the mix and it all kind of um, goes in the wrong direction again. So really, really frustrating for people, but we are where we are. Um, now, actually in the last 24 hours, swap rates did ease off slightly. And I suspect that's because we're starting to see some kind of content um, around the manifestos and what that's going to look like. So hopefully sort of come the next couple of weeks when the details are much more out in the open, um, the confidence will have come back to the market, at least in some um, degree. But that's going to be why you're seeing um, news headlines of people like HSBC increasing interest rates, despite the fact that inflation has come down. We're still talking about a base rate reduction in August. At the moment, um, that's what's going on. So hopefully for those of you who have seen those headlines and thinking, you know, <laughs> why. Um, I hope this at least goes some way to explain it. Now, in terms of the actual lender rates um, in the last week, we've been seeing lenders putting their pricing up. I mean, it's not large step ups, right? It's kind of like 0.1%, 0.15%, so quite small increases. Um, but I think really for those of you who are waiting for rates to come down, I'm afraid you're just going to have to wait a little bit longer. Okay, now moving on to the um, general election. And I think it's fair to say that the key kind of impact for landlords as we know it at this moment in time really sits around the renters reform bill. Um, because even if the Conservatives stay in power, the reality is that the whole process of the renters reform bill is going to have to kind of almost start again. Now, we don't, MFB, particularly expect to see many changes to the revised version of the renters reform bill, um, if that were the case. However, having spoken to um, a landlord association, they're actually thinking that the Conservatives may use it as an opportunity to go back and make changes to the kind of less popular um, elements of the renters reform bill. Now, the Labour Party have not yet published their full manifesto, um, but they do have something called a renters charter. Um, which has got some key policies in it which have been announced. So what we've done is kind of line them up side by side. Um, and so just to run through some of the key differences. So first of all, both parties are going to abolish Section 21. Um, Labour plan to do it on day one of power, whereas um, the Conservatives, it would take slightly longer. But the reality is um, both parties are 
still looking to implement that. Now, one of the things that caught my eye was that there's going to be, um, if the Conservatives um, get through their interest reform bill, as it stands at the moment, there's going to be new powers um, for renteries and antisocial behaviour, sorry, new eviction powers for renteries and antisocial behaviour, which Labour are not proposing. So what this essentially means is that um, in kind of in lieu, I guess, of Section 21 going, um, they'll bring in some new grounds for evictions, which will kind of help um, ameliorate some of those challenges that landlords face. But at the moment, Labour have not um, brought in anything or announced anything along those lines. Now, both parties are um, going to be taking the position that landlords are going to be unable to reasonably refuse pets in properties. And um, we've talked about this in previous weeks. It's actually a really kind of hot topic with landlords, and understandably so. Um, and both land uh, parties are looking to kind of continue with that. They're also both looking to have some kind of landlord portal or register. Um, and speaking to landlords, actually, most of you are not overly concerned about this, as long as the um, mechanism by which people can kind of, like some people are kind of envisioning almost like a trust pilot for landlords. And obviously um, what we don't want is that the tenant, a tenant is able to leave um, very kind of negative reviews um, unjustifiably. So the kind of sense is I'm a good landlord. I don't have a problem with having a portal where people can go on and view me. Um, but actually it needs to be um, arbitrated in a really fair way. So both parties are looking to have a portal. Um, however, the only party that's looking to bring in a property ombudsman at the moment is the Conservatives. Now the property ombudsman, um, I actually think would be a really good thing because what it means is that more things can be dealt with outside of court, which will help up speed up a lot of the kind of um, challenges that um, landlords and their tenants face against each other. Now, the downside of having a property ombudsman would obviously be that someone's got to pay for it. And we all know that the reality is that probably it won't be the tenants, it probably would be the landlords. Um, so I guess there's a kind of concern about how much this would cost. Um, but fundamentally, I think speaking to landlords, the idea of a property ombudsman is actually received very positively. Um, anything which can kind of expedite um, any kind of challenges that are going on between landlord and tenant would be to be applauded, not something that Labour are talking about at the moment. Now, one of the um, uh, new grounds that the Conservatives are bringing in is grounds for eviction to include repeated rental arrears. The Labour Party are not, again, looking to bring this in as far as we know right now. Um, the reason this is important is that actually when you go to evict a tenant, if at any point they are um, up to date with their payment, despite the fact they may have been so, so um, erratic with payments, very, very regular, they could be, you know, six months in arrears, you go to repossess them, they make one payment and actually you have to start all over again. So what they're saying now is that actually if someone is in a, re a repeated non-payer, essentially, and very unreliable, actually this would be grounds for repossession, which I see as a massive positive for landlords, particularly if Section 21 is going to disappear. Labour, on the other hand, are planning to reduce eviction powers for landlords who have tenants in arrears. So they're going the total um, opposite direction. Now, having been through this um, myself, and I know that I talk about this often, what I would say is it's really, really hard to evict a tenant um, who's in arrears at the moment. It's very, very long-winded, it's very, very expensive, and actually it does feel that the law kind of favours the tenant. So actually to give them more powers to remain in properties can only be seen as a negative for landlords. Um, other things just to note, um, Labour are more positively bringing or looking to bring in a portable deposit scheme to make it easier and cheaper for tenants to switch properties. Um, again, you'd only be able to port the deposit with the consent of the landlord who the deposit is currently with. Um, actually, this is a really great thing for tenants. Some tenants really struggle with the fact that to move from one rental property to another, they have to have essentially two sets of deposits, um, a timing issue, no more than that. Um, so actually, that can be a good thing as long as no landlord is left exposed because of it. So thumbs up to that one. And the other thing that Labour are looking to bring in, which the Conservatives have not talked about, is allowing tenants to make reasonable alterations to properties. Now, we discussed this in a meeting um, at MFB yesterday, and actually, broadly speaking, we all felt that allowing a tenant to make reasonable adjustments is a positive thing because what we want our tenants to be is very comfortable, settled in their homes, um, able to be in an environment where they feel that they can live very comfortably for a long period of time. What we do not want is tenants who come in, knock walls down, paint the whole house black or whatever it is. So I think the kind of devil is going to be in detail of what is a reasonable adjustment. Um, so again, I think with that one, um, in theory, it could be regarded as a positive, but we need to see more detail around that one. So hopefully that kind of summarises um, the kind of um, similarities and dis differences within the two parties at the moment. But these things are going to keep moving on over the next few weeks. So all we can really do at this stage is keep you posted.
The Mortgage Works have published one of their very good reports, and this one is called The Regional Snapshot for the UK, and this is covering quarter one, 2024. And it's just really interesting reading. I think it's interesting reading because um, you can kind of compare by region how different areas are faring and also how the landlords are feeling what their kind of behaviours are as well. So it's just quite interesting, particularly, I think, for those of you who are looking to make investment decisions, and that could be investing or divesting um, in the coming months. So in terms of the respondents, the average... A number of portfolio properties in their portfolio was 7.2. The landlords with the highest number of properties in their portfolio were from the northeast, where they had an average 12, and the lowest number was six and a half, and that was in Wales. Now, in terms of average yield, so the average yield across the UK is currently sitting at 6.1%, which is actually very, very high. Um, highest yield came in at 7%, and that's in the northeast, and outer London was the lowest yielding area with an average of 5.2%. In terms of landlord behaviours and what they're up to um, and people buying properties, so on average, 9% of landlords have bought a property in the last 12 months. The North East saw the highest level of investment with 22% of landlords investing, and I'm sure that's going to be something to do with their very, very strong rental yields that we just talked about. Um, South West, the lowest level of investment with just 4% of landlords investing there. Now, in terms of who are selling up, so the average percentage of landlords who have sold a property in the last 12 months is 17%, so compared to 9% who've actually bought. So as we can see, um, the number of landlords who are investing is much lower than the number of landlords who are divesting at the moment. 30% uh, of landlords in Yorkshire and Humber have actually sold something in the last 12 months. They've got the highest um, attrition rate. In outer London, just 11% of landlords had sold a property in the last 12 months. So these are the guys who are selling the slowest. Interestingly, these are the guys with the lowest yields. Um, so I wonder why there's less um, movement there. I suspect it's probably something to do with um, house prices. Obviously, the South East um, more broadly has taken one of the biggest hits in terms of house prices um, over the last 12 months. I suspect these guys who are thinking about selling are probably thinking well, I'm just going to sit on my hands and wait for the market to recover before I make any large decisions. OK, now in terms of how portfolios are performing and rental uh, of rent arrears. So on average, 29% of uh, landlords, respondents had had um, a rental arrear of some description. Um, the highest level of rent arrears actually in the UK, according to this report, was 48%, which is massive, and that was in the northwest of England. Um, central London had the lowest level of people reporting any sort of rent arrears, and that was in central London at just 21%. And lastly, in terms of void periods, so on average, 36% of respondents had experienced some sort of void period. Um, in Yorkshire and the Humber, these guys had the highest level of reporting a void period at 44% of respondents, whereas the east of England had the lowest level of uh, void period reporting with just 25%. So as you can see, there's a lot of kind of variation amongst the different regions. I think we've kind of touched in a region on all of the regions at some point in this report, um, but lots of kind of disparities in terms of how landlords portfolios are performing if you would like to see a full copy of this report because it is quite interesting do just email us in inquiry at mfbrokers.co.uk and we'll very very happy to share that with you and lastly for this week just to talk a bit about house prices briefly because home track have published their uk house price index which i find really interesting home track are not an estate agent they have no kind of um, vested interest they're just very factually reporting data which is why i always defer to this report so first thing you need to know is that annual UK house price inflation is currently running at minus 0.1%. Now, what you would have seen recently is lots of um, kind of headlines about house prices, asking prices um, being the highest that have been for many months. There's a big difference between um, asking prices and sold prices. And obviously there's a time lag between the two because, you know, it takes a few months to sell a property. So at the moment, if we're looking at sold prices... Um, house price inflation is currently across the UK on average minus 0.1%. At city level, um, price inflation ranges from minus 3% in Ipswich, which has seen the lowest drop, to plus 3.6% in Belfast. And we'll come into more granular detail in terms of how various cities are performing in a moment. Momentum in sales activity continues with 13% more sales agreed. So actually more houses are selling this time, uh, this year than last and there are more homes for sale than at any point in the last eight years, up 20% year on year in number terms and 25% higher in value terms. So what it looks like is there are more properties coming for sale to the market, and but also actually these tend to be the larger, um, higher value properties. More supply boosts choice and will keep inf price inflation in check in H2. So essentially what they're saying is because there's more properties coming to market, 
um, what they're not expecting is to see house prices kind of do anything too crazy in terms of increasing because actually with a lot of supply that can keep prices down. And the north-south divide in terms of house price inflation is set to remain. Um, hard luck for those of us in the south of England, and I'm included within that. Um, we're going to have the tougher time in terms of what our house prices are doing. And the general election is likely to reduce the upward momentum in sales agreed, but committed buyers will continue to con uh, secure sales. What they're essentially saying is that the upcoming election is now going to stall the market because you know, it's uncertainty and no one likes to make big financial decisions in a time where it's uncertain. So we're expecting that to kind of stall um, house prices and doing anything you know, too exciting. Um, but actually, we do expect that house sales that are in the pipeline, and there's actually a huge number of them, I think it was 340,000, they will continue. No one's expecting people to go, oh, general election, not going to buy the house now. So people who are kind of in will continue to stay in, but those people who are um, haven't yet put, kind of got the process in place will probably just hold off for a few weeks to see how dust settles. Now, in terms of actually more granular detail by um, cities, so we talked about Belfast, which has seen the highest growth in terms of property prices year on year at 3.6%. Um, actually, it is head and shoulders above its next kind of closest city, which is Glasgow at 1.9%. Newcastle at 1.4% and Manchester at 1.4%. Now, if we go into the kind of reverse, so um, Aberdeen has seen um, the highest level of um, house price reductions, which is uh, minus 1.8%, Bournemouth minus 1.4%, Southampton minus 1.1% and Portsmouth minus 0.9%. And obviously there's a load of cities that kind of sit in between the two. So as you can see, you know, again, um, the housing market is a kind of, like we said earlier, very much of north-south divide. Um, and in summary, I think what we're going to see is that, you know, the house prices are going to maybe continue to kind of increase very, very slowly in the north. I suspect the south will be more kind of vulnerable um, to any reaction from the election news. So I think for now we can expect things to stay fairly kind of similar in terms of the trajectory um, that we've been on um, until the dust settles over the election. And that's everything for this week. So lots and lots of news. Unfortunately, um, what it doesn't contain is mortgage rates are coming down. But hopefully, like I say, as we continue to kind of progress um, through the election campaigns and people can really see what each party is about and what they're looking to do, um, fingers crossed, we might actually see swap rates start to ease off as confidence starts to return. But as of course, we're going to keep you posted. If you have any questions, do give us a call 0345 345 6788. Um, you can go on our website, there's loads of information. There's also an online chat facility, actually. I never talk about this, but it's really good. Um, so during office hours, there's always someone available to be able to kind of chat with you online if that's your preferred method of contact, or you can email us. Have a lovely week. Hopefully, the weather's going to continue like this for now. Um, it's joyous, isn't it, when the sun's out? So We'll be seeing you next week, um, obviously slightly more suntanned and with hopefully some better interest rate news.